Hello, welcome to another Cosmology Talk. Today we have Johannes Noller, who is a senior lecturer at Portsmouth, and Scott Melville, who is a research fellow at Cambridge. Today they'll be talking about a paper that was looking at certain properties of a certain type of theory of modified gravity, specifically the scalar tensor models, and the consequences of those conditions for low energy theory. And the new stuff in their paper was to look at the effects of gravitational interactions with matter. And the uh, conditions have, have consequences for dark energy parameter space. And in the last sentence of the abstract, they made a very bold claim that all low energy theories should have gravitational waves that travel superluminally, which was very, very interesting. And I'm very keen to hear more about. So if you guys want to start off by saying what you did that is described in the paper. So uh, the overall picture kind of what we do in the paper is we derive these new uh, positivity bounds, uh, which are really a theoretical consistency criteria for theories of dark energy here in this case. And we're pairing them with the kind of more classic data-driven constraints from large-scale structures, for example, from CMB physics. And by putting together these kind of new theoretical criteria with the more classic data-driven ones, really try to zoom in more on the, on the nature of dark energy. And maybe to say something a little bit more about the underlying idea for these positivity bounds. It's really a very simple idea, which is just that uh, dark energy theories, the way we think about dark energy, these theories are really effective theories of the physics going on at very large scales. And as you go to smaller and smaller and smaller scales, eventually you'll get to a scale where you can't really resolve the physics anymore at those scales. So if you try to go past the scale, there's really a cutoff you hit. And if you try to go further, the theory is no use anymore, right? You can't really make predictions anymore. And so all of these theories, they always come with an implicit question of embedding, which is really that you want to take this effective theory that describes the large scales, and you want to embed it in a more complete theory that also allows you to describe smaller scales. And so that's really what we call a UV completion, right? And very often we are in a situation where, where we don't really know what this UV completion should be at all, really, and certainly not precisely. But the really nice feature here, and what we're kind of trying to make use of uh, by, by some of these new bounds here, is that very often, even with the, with the very minimal knowledge we have about what kind of features you would expect of this UV completion, of these extensions to smaller scales, that knowledge is enough that we can identify theories or regions in parameter space where it's not really possible to take these effective large-scale theories and extend them to sensible theories of smaller scales. And so, so when you can find these regions and these theories, these are bad theories, right? These are unphysical. But of course, eventually you want something where the underlying physics can describe both the large scales and the small scales. And so you can kind of reverse engineer this to use these new theoretical insights, right, about the, about the structure of these small scale completions to place constraints back on the effective dark energy theories. I like to think of it as a kind of happy complementarity here between observational constraints on the very large scales and these new positivity bounds, which really give you new information about the small scale physics. And you kind of put all this information together and you try to, to do that in such a way that you can really exploit it and learn more about the dark energy theories. So that's uh, that's the ambitious aim we have here. I guess this in, in motivation is similar to the whole sort of swampland idea where there's certain conditions that must be satisfied and then they result in certain consequences. But I guess your conditions are quite different. I think it's a very good analogy, right? Because I guess the underlying picture is essentially saying that if you know something about the UV completion, you can use that to learn something about the low energy theory too, right? So I guess there's sort of a scale of options and then the two extremes are either you saying you really know what the high energy physics is, so you marry yourself to the idea that string theory is the theory of everything. And then if you know a lot about the high energy physics, you can use that uh, to tell you a lot of constraints on the low energy physics too, right? That's a lot of extra information. And what we do here is in a sense more, more minimal, but also more robust, right? We're not trying to, to really postulate what the precise theory is. We're trying to pick out some fundamental features that any physical theory we've seen so far should have, causality, locality, some notion of probabilities, and just with these minimal notions already place some constraints. So it's sort of a sliding scale, uh, depending on how much you want to put in. Swamplands is putting in a lot of assumptions about the ING physics, and we are kind of more towards the more minimal end, I guess. Cool. Okay. So uh, if people are remembering this talk in a few months' time or a few years' time, and there's only two things that they take away that they're still remembering, what would you want those two things to be? So I think the kind of first big take-home message is that not all low energy effective theories can be embedded successfully in some high energy framework. And in fact, there are some regions of parameter space in which it is impossible to ever find a sensible high energy completion of the theory, at least one that looks anything like the standard quantum field theories that we know. 
Good. So then the second take home message is that these constraints that we're talking about, these positivity bounds that come from the small scale physics, they actually have a big impact on the way we analyze data. So for instance, they can be implemented as a theoretical prior. So rather than trying to fit your observations using just any old values of these effective parameters, you can instead refine your fit to use only the regions of parameter space which could have come from a consistent UV theory. So that's the second take home message that by folding in these UV considerations into how we analyze data in the IR, you can really gain big, big improvements in your parameter estimation and really improve the constraining power of your data. All right, so let's get into the background then. Uh, what was the state of play before your new paper? What was unsolved that you tried to solve? Why was it unsolved? A useful perspective to take in terms of what the background motivation is, why we're doing what we're doing here, is to really just think about how we actually go about testing theories of dark energy or gravitational theories in general. And uh, very often what we do is a kind of very rough and ready approach, right? Where we think of some parameter space and try to trace out in theories, right? Different regions where dark energy physics may be different. So we have these large parameter spaces and there's a price to pay, right? For considering these large parameter spaces, which is really that you have these, uh, these big regions of parameter space and some of them are physical, but some of them are really just not. You have regions of parameter space, which are somehow artifacts of the way you've chosen the parameters and you're mapping out the space, and they don't really correspond to any underlying physical. So this is not just true for the positivity bounds we talk about, but also more general. And what you'd really want to do is that you would like to weed out these regions of parameter space, these bad theories, before you use the fantastic data that we have to really learn about uh, the physics there, right? You want to discard all the stuff that you know is no good. And so the, the, we can do some of this work already, right, without ever going to positivity bounds or so, right, just by looking at, at these effective large-scale theories of dark energy and doing internal consistency checks, right? So you can diagnose some of these sicknesses a little bit. And so, you know, these are things like trying to look at the energy spectra, finding well-defined lowest ground states, finding instabilities, you know, gradient instabilities, ghost instabilities, this kind of stuff. And so that's great, right? These are sort of internal consistency checks that we can already use to find out more about where to best look for promising new physics. Uh, but we, what we kind of want to do here is we want to do better, right? This is why we're trying to look for extra information that's not already intrinsically there in the large scale physics, but why we want to go to these smaller scales and try to find even more physics we can put into the data analysis, right? And so what, what at least I think what's, what's really exciting here, right, is that I think in doing this, what we're doing is we're, we're kind of building this bridge, right, where on the one hand, we have the classic large-scale structure data constraints, right, this is where dark energy could be at home, very large scales, we have large-scale structure bounds, CMB bounds, rigid space distortions, this kind of stuff. And on the other side of this bridge, there are the much smaller scales where we don't even really know how to test this theory with observations, how to really get some, some extra information there. And so the reason we, we're quite excited about doing this in the first place is that the tools that we're using in these positivity bounds that we're trying to extract, they're giving us this extra information from small scales about where the physics really wants to go. And this is kind of giving you a sort of a looking glass, right? It's a tool for you to peek ahead a little bit into the high energy physics and extract this extra information and to kind of you know, bring it back, you kind of walk back over this bridge and bring this extra information back to the large scale physics. In my mind, the catchphrase is really, you want to put as much of the physics into the data analysis as possible, right? And that's really what you're doing here. You're kind of finding these new physicality priors and you're putting that in there. So kind of moving on a little bit in, uh, in terms of what's been done before, like what you're saying, this is not the first paper, right? Where, where some of these bounds have been computed. We and some others in the field have started computing some of those. So what we're really doing here specifically is more adding to the menu a little bit, right? Finding some new bounds, right? put even more physics into it. And maybe the final thing I'd like to say here is one motivation, at least for us, is also related to the kind of tools that are at play here, which is that you're really using these particle physics techniques here to learn more both, both about, the, about the small scale and the large scale physics. And so in that kind of picture, you're really thinking of the different degrees of freedom, the different variables in the game. And so if you think of some dark energy theory, for example, these degrees of freedom, we're thinking of them as particles, really. And the picture we have in mind, for example, is that say you take some of these dark energy particles and you scatter them off each other or off some other particles. Thinking about these kind of scattering processes is very powerful here because we kind of know how to use this to build the bridge, right? We know how to encode some of the features of the small scale physics that we think a UV condition should have. When we know how to encode this in the scattering process. And on the other hand, we also know how to link these kind of calculations to the more phenomenological 
large scale structure side. And so a very practical motivation for all of us, right, was that the, the between the three of us, Claudius, God, and I, that we kind of had all the techniques in place to build all the different parts of this bridge and to kind of bridge this gap and put it all together and now add some further bounds, try to get a little bit more physics scraped out of the pool of the small scale high energy physics. And specifically, one of the new things you considered in this was interactions with matter. So was it previously calculations had just looked at gravity as a kind of independent thing? In any modified gravity theory, the, the modified gravity could also be considered matter by just changing the side of the equation it's on. But I guess here specifically, it's like standard model matter. And so is that the main new thing, specific new thing in the paper? Or have I read that right? Yeah, that's right. That's right, Sean. As Johannes was saying, somehow the grand motivation is that recently particle physicists have developed a really good understanding of how particles scatter off of each other. Mm -hmm. So what we and others have been trying to do is import as much of that knowledge and understanding as we can into to cosmology to constrain theories like dark energy. And the way that's done is by thinking of your dark energy field as really being quantized. And you can have quanta of dark energy that interact with each other and scatter off each other. And in this paper in particular, what we wanted to do is to focus on the effect of having matter fields in the universe. Because usually in cosmology, we just treat the matter as some perfect fluid. But the main insight here is that these matter fields, I mean, of course, you can quantize them as well and think of them as being particles that can interact with and scatter off the dark energy quanta. And so by thinking about these processes in which you have some dark energy particle and some matter particle, and they come in and scatter and go out again, those processes give us a new set of bounds that we can place on the dark energy parameter space. And then we can study what they mean as theoretical priors. Well, why had this not been done before? Is it just that literally research has to be step by step and you can't get to the step until you've done the earlier steps? Or was there some kind of technological breakthrough in the particle physicists with their calculations of how scattering works or, or something like that? What was the, the reason why this paper came out in 2021 and not 2018? That's a good question. I mean, one way to think about it is that Usually when we write down some effective description for cosmology on cosmological scales, some theory of dark energy, the relevant scales are the Hubble rate today, mm -hmm. right? Which is vastly lower in electron <laughs> volts than the scales that are relevant for standard model physics. Mm -hmm. So usually you write down some, some theory, some Lagrangian, it's got all your nice dark energy pieces. And then, you know, the matter would just be some effective fluid that you add and you wouldn't really resolve the matter Lagrangian into its different, say, standard model components, right, yeah. from, from a, you know, effective field theory point of view. And here we're pointing out that there is something to be gained by at least doing the thought experiment, right? Here, we're, we're not proposing you would measure, you know, a dark energy particle scattering off of a standard model particle, mm -hmm. but the fact that such a process could happen in principle in nature, it's just yeah. we don't resolve it with our experiments, right? But it, it happens in nature. And that gives you already some non-trivial constraint on the theory. So in that sense, the reason it wasn't done was just that people maybe didn't expect that it would have interesting consequences, but it turns out it does. Yeah, that's right. So somehow it fits into this positivity framework, yeah. right? You're trying to bridge between things that are happening on very small scales and things that are happening on very large scales. And from the point of view of just large scale phenomenology, then you, you really could just treat the standard model as some fluid, right? But now that we're trying to import small scale information, actually, you can get something non-trivial out of saying I can scatter dark energy against the standard model. So small scales here doesn't actually mean like hardcore Planck scale quantum gravity stuff. It, it actually means like our scales. All right. Do you guys want to get into the details now? Excellent. Good. So, so in terms of some of the finer detail of what's going on here, let me start by painting the kind of central idea behind really all effective parameterizations. And that's that we imagine that the detailed fundamental physics on very small scales can be wrapped up, neatly packaged into a small number of constant coefficients, which really govern the effective dynamics on large scales. And this approach is super useful for a few reasons, right? One of the main ones being that in practice, these underlying UV details are often either not known or they're just too complicated to work with explicitly. So in practice, it's convenient to be able to work instead with a much simpler effective description. And the other very pragmatic reason is that the measurements that we do are typically of very large scale, low energy phenomenon, right? So the 
large scale phenomenology that we have experimental access to is really controlled by these effective EFT parameters. For people who aren't super familiar with it, I, I guess is, is a really good example of that, the Fermi electroweak theory where you had stuff like electrons and neutrinos interacting directly and you just had some coupling of them. And of course, as you went to higher energies, that became incorrect and you had to start thinking about W and Z bosons. But as long as you didn't go to high enough energies, you could just treat them as electrons that direct with neutrinos. That's right. Yeah, that's exactly right. So that, that's actually what this kind of next line in the slide is, is getting at, right? This picture that you can have in your mind is that if we think about some standard quantum field theory observable, right? Say the amplitude or the probability that two particles come in and they interact and they go out again. From the point of view of the fundamental theory, this interaction is kind of mediated by all of the complicated high energy physics that you have, right? In the example that you just gave, it would be fermions interacting by exchanging W and Z bosons, right? At the electroweak scale. And that gives rise to some amplitude, which depends on the energy with which the fermions come in and go out. And that can be quite complicated, but if you think about it, very low energies, right? When this interaction energy S is very small, we should be able to just Taylor series expand this amplitude. And if you like, these effective field theory parameters are really just the coefficients in this low energy Taylor series expansion. And so that kind of lets you see why if you really wanted to reconstruct the underlying high energy physics to go to very high S, you would really need a huge number of these EFT parameters. But if you're only interested in the low energy physics at small S, then you really only need the first two or three of these guys and you can get a really good handle on the physics. Great, so the main idea behind the positivity bounds that we've been using in this work is that even when we do not know the detailed UV physics, right? Imagine you live in a world where you don't yet know about the W and the Z bosons, right? All you have are the effective for Fermi interaction. We can still get a long way by using the fact that whatever this fundamental UV physics is, it had better respect certain basic properties. Yeah. And these basic properties leave characteristic imprints on the low energy effective parameters. So when I say basic properties, yep. three that we use in, in our work here are unitarity, which is just the property that allows probabilities to be added up quantum mechanically and give a sensible answer. Causality, which is the property that says there's some maximum speed or some space-time cone that limits the transfer of information. And finally, locality, which is the property that any two things only interact if they're sufficiently close in space and time. If you turn these very basic physical principles into properties of scattering amplitudes, then you can show that the coefficients in this expansion, certain ones have to be sign definite, right? So you get some kind of positivity condition on the coefficients in your low energy expansion, which have to hold just by virtue of the fact that whatever is mediating this interaction, you don't know its details, but you know it's physically sensible. It's hard to even imagine a possible reality that doesn't have the first two. The third one, I guess in the context of quantum field theory, it's hard to think about how you'd have to dramatically change how quantum field theory works to add non-locality. But so long as unitarity and causality are satisfied, I can imagine a universe that doesn't have locality. Most of the time, the reason why I would tell other people locality is important is that, that because of special relativity, it's necessary to have causality. Yeah, you know, Sean, that's exactly the right way around that I would like you to have it. So in terms of how crucial each of these properties are, the first two uh, we absolutely need. Um, it actually turns out that the kind of locality you need here is, is pretty weak. So for instance, these positivity bounds would also be respected by any string theory UV completion, right? And there's an example where you go from point particles to now you're talking about extended objects and, and you might think, oh, well, there's some definitions of locality that maybe don't apply there. It turns out that we really just need kind of one of the weakest forms of locality and it's respected by not only standard quantum field theories but also by string theory. So I would say that it's unitarity and causality are the ones that we really do need in the strongest sense. So these are our positivity bounds. That's the crash course in what positivity bounds are. They're constraints in certain low energy effective parameters and they come from certain fundamental features of the underlying small scale physics. And so if this bound were violated, then like we said at the beginning, it's telling you that there is no high energy completion of this theory. There is no small scale physics, which is causal and unitary, right? And that, that's a big deal. 
There won't be any more detail in this video about how unitarity, causality, and locality lead to these specific positivity bounds, which is fair enough because Johannes and Scott have to cover a lot in the context of particle physics and cosmology. But it is a little bit unsatisfying. There's no kind of heuristic understanding that we, the viewer, get of exactly why these lead to this. So what we have done is Scott and Johannes have recorded a supplementary video with me where Scott goes into some detail of how a positivity bound would arrive in a specific circumstance of just one particle traveling through space and then sketches how that would be developed to, to lead to positivity bounds in the more realistic cases and watching that does give one uh, at least a heuristic understanding of how unitarity causality and locality does lead to these effective field theory parameters having these positivity bounds so if you feel unsatisfied with the explanation up to this point i definitely recommend watching that video if you don't feel unsatisfied no worries carry on, enjoy the rest of this video. So what we did in this work in particular, in this paper, we considered a process that looks like this. You have some dark energy uh, particle goes in, interacts with some matter particle. And what we showed is that if you assume these basic features, unitarity, causality, and locality of whatever high energy physics is mediating this process, then that's enough to derive new bounds on the dark energy parameters. And one striking consequence of these bounds, at least in the specific model that we studied, is that causality in this small scale fundamental theory requires that at low energies, any matter field which can take part in the scattering has to travel slower than gravitational waves. Now, since gravity, i.e. the metric, is the thing that determines the causal structure of space-time, this result has a kind of nice interpretation. It's really saying that gravity is the fastest thing in town, that right. any standard model field or any other matter field that you can couple to has to be going slower than gravity. So, so your words did not have the less than or equal, but I see on your slide you do have the less than or equal. So it, it is totally okay for light to travel at the same speed as gravity, just not faster, is that right? So it turns out that the strictly equal corresponds to a free theory. Okay. And so the short answer to your question is that when I write like this, less than or equal to, I'm kind of allowing for a really simple case where there's just like no interaction. Maybe a sort of quick optics analog is useful, right? So if you think of the way we probe media, right? When we have some prism or something like this, one way to sort of learn more about this is it's just by shining lights. And we're, I guess we're quite comfortable that that these things can have different refractive indices, right? The speed of light as we go through a medium can be different, right? We, we don't get freaked out by, by electrons being faster than light and water or things like this, right? Light can have different speeds. And so now when we have these new degrees of freedom, whereas before you can kind of think of as your gravitational wave as essentially all intents and purposes traveling through a vacuum where nothing exciting happens, now, the gravitational wave is not just traveling through some boring medium, but through something potentially more exciting, right? Because the, there is the background of the dark energy field. And as far as the gravitational wave is concerned, this thing may now have exciting refractive indices, right? So that's a different way of getting at this interacting, right? If the medium is sufficiently interesting, then it can affect the, the relative speed of the gravitational wave, both with respect to light or other particles by itself. Yeah, fantastic. You're good. So, so this slide is, is kind of about the conceptual side of what's going on, right? The, the inputs from the, the conceptual side are that on very small scales, whatever the you know, fundamental mechanism behind dark energy is, are supposing that it's unitary, causal, and uh, at least in some weak sense, local. And then we're showing that if that it were the case, then the parameters that appear in your low energy, dark energy effective field theory have to be bounded in a particular way. And that one interesting consequence of these bounds, at least in the model that we looked at here, is that you have this nice inequality between the speed that gravitational waves have on this background to the speed that the matter fields have on this background. So then the second thing that we did is show how these bounds really impact current observational constraints. And for that, I'm going to hand back over to Johannes. I've just kind of heard from Scott already about conceptual backdrop and how in principle we can compute these bounds. And I now want us to kind of go through what I'm calling case study here, which is really just a, a very, very concrete example, kind of give you a flavor of how this all comes together and how it can actually impact data-driven constraints really on dark energy. So this is going to be a story of one plot, and then I'm sort of slowly going to build up. What I have in mind here 
is again theories where dark energy is described by a scalar. So this is going to be some scalar tensor theory, the standard tensor as you have a general relativity, some, some scalar field that's responsible for dark energy. So that's our toy setup. And when you have these theories, the particular bit of phenomenology I want to look at here is, uh, is large scale structure constraints mainly. And in these cases, something that, uh, that you often want to look at, especially in very large scales, is uh, small scale fluctuations, right? Linear fluctuations, that's where a lot of the constraints come from for, for a lot of these things. So something that's fairly well understood when trying to understand these scalar driven dark energy theories is that there's really only a couple of functions that really kind of map out all the interesting physics, all the interesting directions in this parameter space. The small scale fluctuations just get controlled by a few functions. And so you can, you can parameterize them. And so you have a, a corresponding handful of parameters that kind of tell you about the different interesting aspects of physics going on here. So I've cherry picked two. There's really a sort of multi-dimensional parameter triangle plot in the background, but we're just zooming in on two here, kind of look at the essential physics. And the two parameters I'm uh, zooming in on, one here on the y-axis, this uh, CT parameter, which is, uh, is very closely related to what Scott was saying, so what the speed of gravitational waves is, it's a measure of this. As we go up here, this is the region where gravitational waves travel faster than matter, we called it previously. Here I'm signaling out photons as the kind of paradigmatic matter particle. And vice versa, as we go down, photons get faster than gravitational waves. All the way down here, this is essentially the speed where gravitational waves travel at, uh, at zero speed. So there's already an unphysical region down here, which we'll never go to get to, and where the speed of gravitational waves somehow becomes imaginary. So that's our y-axis. And then on the x-axis here, there's another parameter where we again kind of go to this particle picture. And we're now thinking of interactions, as we said before, uh, between metric perturbations, for example. So in the in gravity picture, really, of the graviton in some sense. And it's a measure of this parameter here of how much interaction there is between metric perturbations between the graviton and between the star energy scale. So in this parameter space, it's all set up so that uh, general relativity or lambda CDM right, sits here at the zero, zero point. And so this parameter space kind of traces out different models of dark energy where some of these parameters differ from the GR values, right? So at this point here, gravitational waves just travel at the speed of light, and there's no interesting interactions going on. Now, we're going to look at a very, very concrete, a very specific theory here. So this is the, the point is really to have this as a toy theory. To illustrate this is not to glorify this theory as the, as the perfect answer to, to anything really in particular. It's a scalar tensor theory. So you can see little scalars distributed along here, this phi. And you can see these three functions, this G2 and this G4, which are functions of the scalar through this particular Lorentz invariant combination here. And you can also see classic Einstein-Hilbert piece here from general relativity. So standard GRL and the CDM is also included in this. So this is our little toy theory here. And it's really just chosen because it's particularly convenient for us. It's something where it was very convenient to both figure out the positivity bounds, how they get mapped onto constraints and observables, kind of build this bridge and put it all together. So it's really driven by, by computational ease, not by some fundamental insight of this particular. Just to say one word here, a little bit about where, where these parameters are coming from, was telling you that for scalar tensor theories like this one here, there's only a handful of free functions, which are really combinations of these uh, free functions in the Lagrangian, the fundamental theories and derivatives thereof. And they kind of really control all the physics that's governing linear perturbations, small scale perturbations, as you may measure in the CMB, uh, so, so this Lagrangian you've written down in this toy model is the fundamental theory. It's not the low energy effective one. No, no. Ah, okay. So, so uh, yeah, we're uh, semantics again, right? So here, this is the the low energy effective theory that's that's really governing this. So I think that there's um, I guess this is an important point, right? So there's sort of different levels of EFT here. So think of it as the and on very small scales, there's this this uber fundamental theory here, right? The way we're thinking of it. Then on larger scales, there's a sort of first set of effective description, which describes all of the large scale physics, linear physics, nonlinear physics, and so on. And now we are, we're kind of condensing this even more, and we're looking at the, at the effective description that only describes the small perturbations of that large scale theory. Excellent. So now there are some of these combinations of these parameters that govern the small scale physics. And so this guy here is essentially kind of telling you whether there's any difference in the speed of gravitational waves from the speed of light, positive or negative. And we're choosing this particular parameterization here, which is kind of driven both by phenomenological considerations and motivated by some other specific models. This is something very crude, right? This is something where, where you're kind of phenomenologically assuming that dark energy only really starts being relevant at late times. So your first best guess is that some deviations from general relativity from lambda CDM here are somehow only becoming relevant once dark energy becomes relevant. 
all we get dark energy here. But this is really just the crude parameterization. It's something we use because it's one of the most common standard things used in literature for these kind of things. And so we have an apples of apples comparison with previous bounds. But just to say that there are better ways to do this. And I'm shamelessly plugging here a paper where, where we discussed some of these, which just came out a couple of days ago. So I'm kind of trying to park that in a, in a different discussion. And, and just, I, I might be helping literally nobody out here, but just in case people are wondering, like, I guess it looks naively like there are no interactions here, but of course there are interactions because the covariant derivatives are carrying information about the metric on, on phi here. But maybe everyone already knows that, but in case there are people wondering, I, I figured I'd point that out. No, no, that, 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 that's, uh, uh, I, I think that's a really important point, right? So if you think of the, of the covariant derivative, especially these terms where you have two, of these guys here, you can kind of think of how that, how you can split this up into, into your Christoffel symbols and the Christoffel symbols really know about little perturbations in the graviton too, right? So these are secretly interactions between the, the scalar and some, some degrees of freedom in your gravity. Um, wonderful, okay, so, so this is the basic framework and I'm gonna stress again, right, this toy theory to look at this now. And so now, now that we sort of have the toy setup out of the way, we can kind of start thinking of how observational bounds and the more theoretical driven ones really interact. So let's do this, right? First, uh, we put positivity bounds to one side and we just put data large scale structure constraints onto this plane here. You can kind of see a, a laundry list of different experiments uh, and different types of measurements that I'm putting down here that we're using here. Not to go through all of them, I guess the, the, something that's interesting to point out is uh, these constraints are really mainly driven by two particular bits and pieces. So the first is CMB data. This is the late time integrated Sachs Wolf effect. So, looking at very large angular scales on the CMB that teach you a little bit about dark energy interactions. So, this is driving some of the constraints here. And the second part, which is the kind of most complementary here, comes from redshift space distortions, which are really just a measure of clustering, right? How, how matter clusters that gets influenced again also by dark energy interactions. And something that's important that I should say here as well in the, in the simplified setup we're using, we're assuming that the background expansion is really just like lambda CDN. We are now just testing these small scale fluctuations. There's various ways of opening up more and more freedom in your parameter space, but we have choosing the simple example to illustrate the impact of these different priors. Perfect. Okay, so this is this is now no positivity bound so far, right? This is just data constraints on these standard priorities. Here, so now let's see how this talks to positivity, right? Because that's what we're really after. And the the first one is the one that Scott was already sketching in his plots here, right? Because he was telling you that for for the kind of theories we're looking into. One of the bounds that you get from scattering this dark energy particles, in this case, the scalar here, of matter particles like photon or so, was telling you that gravitational waves had to move faster than matter, right? Faster than photons. So that's already telling us that we should live in this upper part of the plot here. So that's already interesting because the pure, pure data constraints, kind of where, you know, this is not a significant preference, but there was certainly a little bit of a lean towards a different region of the parameter space. So it's already telling you something interesting. So now let's do this, right? Let's put this theoretical prior in and rerun the data analysis. And voila, what we get is this, right? No big surprises. We're already just saying that we, we need to be in this upper half of the line here. You kind of see that this kind of nicely lines up. And this is really how the positivity bound, I guess, you know, worked out as a theoretical bound and now implemented as a theoretical prior into the data analysis kind of moves your contours here. There's some pretty tight constraints on CT now based on the neutron star collision gravitational wave detection, right? Where, where would those bounds appear on this particular scaling for your constraints from perturbations? So remember how earlier on we were saying how if we have dark energy theories that describe the large scale physics as smaller and smaller scales, at some point they, they break down and we don't really know how to make predictions there anymore. Something that turns out to be the case for these theories that we're looking to here is that the energy scale where we can't really make predictions anymore sits slap bang in the LIGO band. This is something that Scott and Claudia looked at before. So this is making two important points, right? First of all, it's the point that, that you were raising already earlier on, Sean, right? Which is that the, this difference between large scale and small scale is not, not something about some tiny Planckian scales, right? The, the, this kind of division we can have here can be pretty macroscopic things, right? We're talking about length scales around a thousand kilometers, it's like this here. And that's already this transition between large and small scales here. And so what that means in the context of these specific theories here is it's not so trivial to take constraints from the neutron star merger and map it onto the theory that describes cosmological perturbations. Because we don't really know how to compute what the prediction should be 
for something like this gravitational wave merger. It's so close to the scale where some new physics needs to come in that we can't really use this other theory to make predictions. Hello, me during editing here. So Johannes gave a good answer there, but in the talk, I still had a confusion uh, that might be shared by others. Unfortunately, in my attempt to articulate my confusion and then understand their answer, the conversation got really, really muddled and there's no real salvageable piece of that. So I'm going to try and repeat in my own words, the answer that they eventually managed to, uh, to get across to me. So my confusion was about what the relevant distance scale here is, because in one sense, the distance scale is the distance between the neutron star and us. After all, that's the distance over which the speed of gravity and speed of light has been measured. However, what is actually relevant is the scale being the wavelength of the light or gravity that is traveling over that distance. That is what the distance scale that predicts the speed actually is. So in that sense, even though the distance from the neutron star to us is obviously a large distance scale and should be covered by the low energy theory, the actual wavelength of the lightened gravitational waves emitted by the neutron star collision is sufficiently small that as far as this effective field theory is concerned, that's already small scale and could have corrections from the higher energy theory. And therefore the constraints on the CT parameter from that are high energy constraints and therefore translating them into a constraint on this low energy parameter is not as trivial as literally just the constraint on the relative speeds. What have we done so far, right? We looked at the pure, I guess, data constraints without any extra theoretical priors from positivity and now putting in this first one, which we derived in this paper that I guess we're, we're talking about. And the final thing I want to say here along those lines is that that's not the end of the road. We can put more information in. And in particular, this is something that, that we've done before already, and we're going to add this now, which is instead of scattering the dark energy particle of the matter particle, photon or so, we can also scatter it off itself, right? We can repeat the experiment, do another thought experiment where we just take two dark energy particles and scatter them off each other. And this is also going to give us some bounds. When we do this experiment, right, this thought experiment, what we find is that it, this also bifurcates your parameter plane here. In particular, it draws this line here and tells us that any physical theories need to live in this upper left corner. Everything to the bottom right is unphysical. So it roughly, again, kind of chops the remaining bit of two sigma parameter space. I haven't mentioned this before, right? But the, the dark colors is one sigma, and the lighter ones is two sigma. The, it kind of chops this into, into half again. You can kind of rinse and repeat, right? The whole procedure. Uh, we can again now put both of these priors on and then run the data constraints. And voila, right, what we end up with is these, these uh, blackish contours over here, which are even more constrained than what we had before. So all the time, as before, this GR value, lambda CDM value is always fine, right? It's always part of this. No, well, it's sort of on the verge of two sigma before the theory constraints. Now it seems totally fine. So that's quite interesting. Yes, yeah. So excellent point. Like everyone, we have too many messages for people to take away, right? So Scott already had the two key messages at the start. Now, now there's three more bonus ones at the end. And so I guess the... The, the first one of those, right, is a, is a very trivial observation, something that's fairly mundane, uh, which is that it turns out these bounds are actually useful, right? So when putting these bounds, they actually put meaningful constraints on this parameter space. You know, you didn't know a priori where they were lying. Maybe they lie so far off the data contours that they don't affect them at all. But actually, they draw meaningful lines here. And you can see that the, the sort of volume and parameter space you have has been chopped down quite a significant bit. And it, so it's giving you useful information, right? That's a... That's a mundane but important point. The second one is, is exactly relates to what you were just saying now, Sean, right? So the and it's 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 really again getting at this notion of the physical and unphysical parameter space. With this extra knowledge that you have now, with these extra extra positivity bounds, you know that the, the physical region of parameter space is really over here. And conditioning on just living in that physical region, the data wants you to to, to be in this spot here, right? In this particular uh, patch. And so if you compare that with what you knew before, right, quote unquote new, there you're in a situation where the data was kind of telling you you're mostly over here, right? And there was even something not to write home about, but like sort of, you know, would be little uh, notice that, that there are certainly regions of parameter space that fit better. What's really important here is now you can kind of understand what was happening, right? Really what you were doing over here is you're overfitting the data with some unphysical parameter values, right? You're, you found some region of parameter space that was fitting your data here really well, but now you know that this is, was not really a physical thing. You're just overfitting the data. So, so I agree that, that obviously it was an unphysical thing, but 
whether it's overfitting or not hasn't been shown by what you've shown so far, right? You'd need to look at chi-squared values or something to see was the previous red region overfitting, as in like the reduced chi-squared was too small? Is that the way it goes? Or was it actually that now you've pushed the data into a region that it really doesn't like? I mean, it's physically, it has to be there, but then there's some sort of tension going on here and, and it's not clear. I mean, maybe you know behind the scenes what the reduced chi-squared was and what you're saying is a true statement, but it's it's not shown by what you've shown. No, no, yeah, I, I, you're right, I understand your point. Okay, and so finally, the third point is kind of a, a little twist to the story, which is kind of nice and interesting because until now, we've told you a fairly linear story, right? Where we've sort of first talked about the, what kind of features we want to have in the fundamental physics and all the fundamental theories we have, these features causality, locality, genitality, things like this. And, and we use those to figure out the good regions of parameter space, we chop out everything else, and then we constrain the data. There's an interesting arrow which points the other way, which I guess is sometimes something that uh, certainly if you're more operationally minded, you find interesting. But suppose that this packet of assumptions that we're putting in, right, some big notion of locality, causality, and unitarity, somehow at very small scales and energies, it just so turned out that physics was extremely strange, right? Very different from any quantum field theory that we've ever seen. Yeah, like, and, and still unitary and causal, but just not quantum field theory or something like that, I guess. No, no, I, I'm, uh, I'm selling the house here, right? I'm going all out. Yeah, but like, I, I don't know, maybe this is an argument to have, an, have it another time, but it just doesn't make sense to something not to be unitary, right? Like, it, like what, what does it mean to say that the probability doesn't add up to one like that that just doesn't make sense anymore right and and for something not to be causal what does it mean like how are you even discussing anything if you're not allowing that what are the fundamental assumptions right there should be some kind of notion of causality right and there should be some sense in which we can interpret probabilities and that's really what these things do right your parity causality and so on and so we have a yes we have a formal way of parsing what these what these criteria are and how we understand it in the context of for example, field theories, quantum particles. But hopefully, we're, we're, you know, we're not going all crack but here. This is, this is, I guess, really just saying that if somehow this package of assumptions is really not the right way to parse some of these criteria at, uh, at high energy, smaller scales, then one way you can think of the of these different tests here is really as a way of testing some properties of the high energy physics with the low energy physics. Right? And so the, the, the picture I'd like to have in mind here, I guess, is Imagine somehow we come to believe that this toy theory we're playing with here really is the fundamental description that goes on. And then we know that the physical region of parameter space, as we said it before, with these assumptions baked in, is in this top left corner here. What now, right, if, they, if in the future there's some fantastic pristine data that comes in and we start to be extremely confident that we're not here, but we're somewhere over here. And then, of course, extraordinary claims need extraordinary evidence, right? But if the data becomes so strong that we really undoubtedly believe that we end up being somewhere here. And in the context, at least of this toy theory, this is kind of telling you that something was off in your package of assumptions, right? That either the notion of locality or entirety or something like this doesn't quite apply. Right? This is really just the, the final twist here. But I think it's interesting to know that it's not just a one-way street, right? You don't just get information from small-scale physics and uh, that you're trying to compute and, and, and use it to... Uh, to learn more about the large scale structure or so. Uh, but there's also a little bit of an element of being able to have these low energy tests of some manifestations of high energy. Is it possible to have other conditions on the high energy thing that are more optional and then see conditions from them on the low energy stuff? Maybe I can jump in here, Sean, oh, just yeah, to respond yeah. to some of these many good points. So it's all very well to say that, of course, unitarity is definitely a thing. To give like a really good example of a whole class of theories that are not unitary is basically any thermal field theory. Anytime you're at a finite temperature, uh, then the rationale there is that you're somehow losing information. You have a system that's thermalizing. You put it in some very special initial state and you let it evolve. And then later you've got no idea what the initial state was because it's equilibriated somehow. That's not a unitary process. Thermal field theories typically are not unitary. Yeah, but they're not fundamental either though, right? Like at the fundamental level, stuff's not being lost. Exactly, that's right. So that's why the, the fundamental theory we think is unitary. But, yeah. uh, you know, it, it could be that there is something fundamentally thermal about the universe. Right. Good. So, so that was that was one 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 comment. So, so I think it is it is still interesting to think yeah, about okay. what these mean for like the consequences for unitarity. The other the other comment that you made about 
whether you can have other UV assumptions that you make and then new bounds in the EFT that you can use as diagnostics is a, is a very good one. And I, and I think that, you know, one, one way to think about this is really as some kind of spectrum like Johannes was describing at, at the beginning in the context of the Swamp Land program, where you've got really some dial in the UV, where you can assume like everything about the UV, like exactly how many fields there are, exactly how it interacts, exactly the symmetry groups that it has. Yeah. And then that'll tell you very precise things about the EFT coefficients. Or you can dial this down and assume much less about the UV. Yeah. And then you get bounds on the EFT coefficients, which are, are more robust because really they should apply for basically any sensible UV physics. So here we're, we've, we've basically cranked the dial all the way down mm. to assuming almost nothing, right? Like the, the bare minimum. But then your question is a good one because in particle physics, the way this is typically done is there's a, a suite of very powerful bounds that come from looking at the kind of symmetry groups that you might have in the UV, for instance. And then you can diagnose from low energy measurements whether you expect certain flavor groups um, to be there in the UV. And uh, so you could imagine trying to do a similar thing in cosmology. That would certainly be, be quite interesting. But the philosophy here was very much, yeah. let's just assume like unitarity and causality, those seem like pretty safe bets. Yeah. Uh, and then that way we can really use them as priors. Sure, because sure, like sure, you were sure. saying, it's, it seems unlikely that the UV is going to violate these things in a significant way. And I think that's, uh, that's it. This is clearly kind of like the first little bridge that's, that's connecting some of these things. Uh, it's kind of mapped from one side to the other. And, and of course, there's, a, there's, a, there's many laws to this too, right? And I guess we'll talk about some future directions in a second. But th this is a, a, in no sense meant to be a sort of comprehensive survey of all the possible way we can sort of put bounds together with general theory spaces and data. Cool. So where to next now that you've got this result? I guess some of the things have come up during the discussion about where you might go to next, such as considering other high energy conditions or other low energy effective theories and, and looking for constraints on that, maybe even looking at other data, but where specifically are you guys intending to, to take this next? What's really exciting here is, is the interplay between advances that are made on the theory side and uh, advances that are made on the observational side. Mm -hmm. So every time uh, we come up with some new positivity bound, either by uh, assuming more about the UV or actually just using the same UV assumptions, but better, working harder to derive stronger consequences from unitarity, causality, and locality. They then shrink these data contours even more, right? They give you even stronger theoretical priors and even better estimates of your low energy parameters. Mm. Conversely, every time there's a new mission, a new, a new set of observations that come in, that also changes what, what these contours look like. And then these positivity yeah. bounds are giving you some bridge that, like we were saying at the end, gives you some way of translating what the observations are into some you know, concrete features of the underlying fundamental physics. So in, in a specific sense, what, what do you foresee over the next 24 months? So certainly, I mean, in the last 12 months or so, there have been a lot of positivity papers, a lot of progress being made in developing new positivity bounds. So I would be surprised if in 24 months time, there is not another positivity bound Oh, yeah, which you could apply to the, sa the same or a slightly different toy model to see how that is shrinking these contours even farther. Mm -hmm. so I, think, I mean, for me, that's definitely a kind of obvious yep. next step. I guess in, in many ways, some of these bounds are already there, right? So I guess the, 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 there's always kind of the, the question of bridging these things together, right? So the, the bits that we've taken from one side and brought to the other side, they are not complete on both sides, right? There's already extra data constraints one can put in on the data side. There are already extra bounds out there that we can also fold into this. And like Scott saying, right, the, 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 both of these are likely to grow, I guess, over the next 24 years, uh, 24 years to uh, 24 months. And maybe the, maybe the one where uh, one kind of extra substantial thing to add, right? So there's, the, there's kind of the two sides of that bridge and one can do more on both, right? Some of these bounds are already there, more bounds are already there. Some of these experimental results are already there and just waiting to be used. One can do more there. But there's also kind of the bridge itself, right? So the, the one can also do better and do more at the level of just mapping one to the other. So as well as you can possibly understand these things. And that's in, in practice, that's, I guess, really an answer to why, why this kind of thing wasn't done so much before. The putting all these bits and pieces together kind of takes various little tiny bits of insight, but you kind of need all the different stepping stones on that bridge. Uh, just to give you one concrete example, right? The reason we chose that specific toy theory was because that mapping was not so straightforward, right? And that was both 
uh, I guess in terms of how to make it, how to do the computation on the on the high energy side, but it was also how to actually in practice put this into a code, right? Put this into an Einstein Boltzmann code, uh, and do the data analysis at the end of the day. And the way these codes are being written and are, is evolving as well, right? We're, we're trying to do things there, but often there were some limitations that were kind of inbuilt, right? For example, often the background was parameterized and evolved separately to how the perturbations were being done, and so you lost some of the connections that were important to kind of get all the physics out. And so we needed to find this toy example where, where the mapping survived, right? These connections kind of kept going through. And so there, there's a lot, also a lot of, I think a lot of progress to be made in just smoothing the pipeline that kind of links these two endpoints. Okay, and you, you guys keep talking about the Lagrangian you used as a toy model. Are there non-toy models? Like what one that could actually be the description of our universe that are accessible to apply this sort of method to or? Or are you being too unfair on that particular model? Is it itself still valid as the actual model of our universe? Or There's nothing fundamentally bad about the model, right? But I guess we, we, we sort of came from a really sort of effective description point of view, right? Where you ideally want to have something that, that doesn't put in so many extra assumptions that are not necessary. So I guess we were saying we, we are looking at models where dark energy is described by a scalar. So, so implicitly, you know, there are some of these notions that, that, uh, that we've like Horndesky theories and so on, right? The beyond are just trying to work in, in a fairly general space and not artificially kind of zooming in on a specific scalar tensor theory. And so what we've done here is we've kind of zoomed in on the specific subset. There's nothing fundamentally wrong about the specific subset, right? But it's 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 very arbitrary from a from a more fundamental point of view. But could one apply this to the full Horndesky Lagrangian then? And and or is it just too many too many parameters there to find anything interesting to say or? No, no, one one can, and I think that's that's a fairly recent thing as well, because the again the the, the bits and pieces linking this kind of weren't in place so much, you know. The, the again at the at the level of extracting the the cosmological constraints of looking at the Einstein Boltzmann solvers, really putting in a full such theory and evolving the background and the linear perturbations all consistently together, that's a, that's a fairly recent thing, uh, which which wasn't really the way it was used to be done. So I think this is partially some a lot of the limitations of you know, why we looked at some sort of specific setups were very much technology driven, but there's no fundamental conceptual stumbling stone where, where you can't do it because somehow conceptually you can't do something better. So I think yeah, th 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 that's a great thing, right? Because I guess technology limited things also mean that you can very fastly progress as we kind of have more and more pool, uh, tools in place. Yeah, I mean, another thing to add to that is that uh, on, the, on the positivity side, on the particle physics side, then, oh, then we, we can and have computed what these bounds would be for a general Horndesky theory. Yeah. But then like Johannes was saying, the limiting, the rate limiting step is, is somehow the, the bridge because then you have this suite of bounds, but you need to find some way to implement them sensibly mm -hmm. in, in, some, in some code. And that's something which only very recently has been, has, yeah. would have been possible. Cool. It does sound like then there'll be uh, lots of active research from lots of people on this in the near future. So exciting to look out for. Cool. Okay. So the last question for both of you, outside of your own research, what do you think is the most interesting thing or things in cosmology at the moment? I would say gravitational waves, right? Because I guess the, the, with the restriction that it's to cosmology, it's really the, the until very, very recently, right? Everything we've seen is via photons. And there's really just this, this complete second channel now, right? That we have and we can, you know, it's, 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 it's in no sense just some isolated systems that we're looking at. We're really looking at, at, at length scales that go from extremely large to much more localized with binary systems. And this, this interesting physics along these kind of lines everywhere, right? From learning more about inflation all the way to learning more about small scale physics. So I think it's it's almost an unfair option to have as an answer to your question, right? And, and Scott, what are your uh, thoughts on that question? Yeah, no, I, I would second gravitational waves. I guess if I had to try and give like a quirky answer to that question, it would be that on the theory side, I mean, recently there's been a lot of progress in resolving, trying to resolve the black hole information paradox. Mm -hmm. While that is not maybe immediately relevant for cosmology, I think it's teaching us something very fundamental just about how horizons work. And, you know, a lot of what's being learned there, I suspect in the next few years will be imported to understanding both the cosmological horizon that we see at late times or applied to inflation. Yeah. I mean, inflation, approximately, to Sitter has some boundary. Uh, and I think, yeah, I, I would be surprised if that work on how to understand black hole horizons remains confined to black holes. 
Okay, thanks everyone for watching. If you like this, please do subscribe and uh, you can click the bell if you want to be notified of future videos and click like to help with the various YouTube algorithms, but more importantly, share the channel with your colleagues and collaborators. Uh, if you have any questions or suggestions, please leave a comment. Um, and other than that, thank you, Johannes and Scott for the great talk. Perfect. Thanks a lot for having us, Sean. Thanks, Sean. Thanks for watching everyone.